Well, we're going to be in the book of First Peter, and we're in a series called Pivot, Pivot. And uh, so, as we look at uh, this whole thing, thanks for being here, thanks for joining me. And uh, we're in First Peter chapter 2, and by God's providence, I, I think God does some amazing things, how he orchestrates different things, and by, God, by God's providence, this week, um, in 1 Peter 2, 2, we're looking at a text that uh, is, is where we are. It's kind of going verse by verse. And so um, today, I, I think it's so fascinating that this becomes our topic for today because of what has happened this past week. Um, this week, on Wednesday, I, 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 we watched as hundreds, thousands of protesters broke into the Capitol building, causing damage to the building while hurting and killing some people that stood in their way. Um, Some claimed that this is something that God wanted them to do. And my question is, I'm diving in deep today, (laughs) is are you praying for me, number one? (laughs) Number two, what biblical response would you give for civil disobedience? What what biblical response would you give for or against civil disobedience? And that's really where our text guides us today. Now, I'm going to give you some thoughts behind this. One, as we dive into this, I'm diving into the Bible. Let me give you a little background about the Bible. The Bible has been around for literally thousands of years, unchanged, which is a fascinating thing when you study out the history of the Bible um, and the history of any literary um, uh, thing that you, any do- literary document that you find, like Iliad the, and, and, and the Odyssey and, and, and things like that that are hundreds of, and thousands of years old. You would look and you'd see changes that happen over time. And you'd see even in, in, in some of the documents that we have of other literary texts, the changes that happen are significant to even the storyline. When you look at the Bible, one of the things that convinces me that I need to go back to the Bible all the time is this, that for the last 2,000 years, there has been no change. Zero. I mean, 0.001% of change, and there's some tiny little minuscule things that are like, yeah, we should, it should have been this, 40 instead of 4, or something like that. Uh, you'd find some, some challenges, and you'd get that because in 1947, they discovered this Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were literally a couple thousand years old, and they opened those, and the critics of the Bible said, oh, now is our chance to go and look at the Bible and to challenge the Bible and say, the Bible is, is terrible. It's, look how bad it is. It's so messed up, and, and then they looked, and the scholars for and against looked and they compared side by side and they saw that the Bible remained the same. And so from 1947 on, we're living in a time where, where we get to see that and so that kind of silenced a whole lot of criticism toward um, the Bible and, and, and that has, has not changed. So if a document like this has existed for 2,000 years and beyond that, really, you have the Hebrew Scriptures, that, what we call the Old Testament, that goes beyond that. If it's existed and has not changed, you would have to say someone cares about this text so much to preserve it for us today and that someone is not an individual. <laughs> it's someone that exists beyond 2,000 years. That's God. So I look and say, God has preserved this text for us, for us to be able to glean from so that we can know him better. That's really the whole point. Now, that's a whole big introduction to what I'm about to say. When I look at civil disobedience and other things that we are struggling with in our our culture, I say, I need guidance. Where am I going to get it from? I can ask all of you and say, okay, what do you think about this? What do you think? And and we can get opinion fest going on, but to be honest, that's only going to help with opinions and polls. When I go back to God's word, I'm going back to objective truth. This just states, here's what you should do, and we move on from that. It's objective truth. This is what happens. This is what God has given to us. And, And so we Take this, and we say, this is what God says, so let's just follow this out, apply it to our life today. So I'm not editorializing. I'm not giving you my own opinion about things. I want to go back to God's Word. And can I just say, as uh, as an aside, what, what we're dealing with in our culture, one of the reasons why there's so much division is because there's nothing objective for us to go to anymore. Okay? Now think about this. 
the news agencies, whether you're watching Fox, CNN, MSN, or, or whatever you want to go to, it doesn't matter which side you go to and where you go to, you have such a disparity of opinions on all different sides because you're reporting snippets and things like that to your advantage and the way you see things ahead of time. It's subjective, not objective. And we're watching this in our culture today, really for the past 20 years, I would say it's become such an amazing divide of how things are reported. And you look at the full context of things and you're like, well, I don't think that, that's not so right and that's not so right. And that's the problem. So the problem that we have in division and arguing with each other is we actually don't know the full truth going back to the source. We think we know and we have an opinion based on what we think we know and what we've decided upon. And so that becomes the challenge. And so sometimes we fight over things that we don't even know the base of where things are at. Okay, that's a whole other conversation, but just had to get that out. All right. So when we go back to God's word, 1 Peter chapter 2, here's the context of what we're going to talk about. Verse 11. We ended out here last week. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you, I urge you, have you ever had mom or dad or your, your brother or sister urge you to do something? I'm urging you as sojourners and exiles. Sojourner and exile. People that don't live and, and that is not their permanent residence. You're just passing through. To abstain from passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13. Be subject. To be subject is to put yourself under the authority of someone else. It's an intentional action that you are doing. I am intentionally putting myself in a position of, I'm, I'm under your authority. I'm subject to what you say and do is where I'm going to go. If you say turn right, I'm turning right. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake. Got to get all the context here. Be subject for the Lord's sake. The Lord equals master. For my master's sake. So he's saying be subject. Talking about this master, the Lord. Lord literally, that word Lord, uh, there literally is curious. It's ma master. He is my master. And he, says, he says be subject for the master, for the Lord's sake. The master Lord, he's above everything. To every human institution. So when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we come to a point of acknowledging that God sent Jesus Christ as a Savior to this world to pay for all of our sins, we come to a point of recognizing what he did for me, and we simply say, yes, I want Jesus to save me from my sin. And for me, that started when I was six years old, I, that, that time where I just said, wow, he, paid for me. he loves me that much, he paid for my sins? And so I accepted Jesus as my Savior in that moment, as my Lord and Savior. And so from that point on, I said, okay, if you love me this much, you're not going to steer me wrong. What do you want me to do in my life? And that was at six. And it played out in seven, eight, nine, ten. And, and then there was a season where I said, I don't want you to be Lord. I don't like this anymore. I want to do some fun things. And I made a choice. Did that mean he gave up on me? No. He was still my Lord. He was just waiting for me to come around <laughs> and did things in my life to bring me around. And isn't that amazing how God is so gracious there? And he continues to work that out. So for the Lord's sake, he's my master. He's my final authority, not anyone else. So be subject for the Lord's sake. He's, my, he's everything to every human institution. Now this is really tough. We're going to try to weed through it a little bit today. To every human institution, to every Republican or Democratic president, to, and, and he goes on, he defines what this means. He says, whether it be to the emperor, we don't have emperors, 
as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. He, he just defines very simply, it's giving the, what the note in that day, the emperor, the governor, whatever, and we would look and we would say, okay, it doesn't matter if it's our governor or mayor or president or whoever it is, for the Lord's sake, we, we are subject, we put ourselves under the authority of every human institution, Republican or Democrat. Now, challenge here. When you get to the next part, here's what he does. He defines what a good government is, the purpose of government. You ever wonder, why do we have a government anyway? There's a lot of talk of anarchy, and let's get rid of government. We don't need them anyway. They can take all our tax money and do crazy things with it. We just don't need the government. I am not into anarchy at all. I don't want you to come steal my truck because you there's no law against it. You follow me? Or kill my kids because <laughs> they're on my nerves. I'm just going to kill them because they, they got in my way. I, no, I, I want someone to have control, and that's what government does. And here's what government does. He lists it out. He says, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So the purpose of government is simple. It's to punish evil and to praise good. To punish evil. Evil is, is easily agreed upon, especially when you go back to the Bible, objective truth. You know what evil and good are. Evil, murder, we would all agree, murder good or evil it's evil okay theft stealing things violence things like that it, it, it's simple these things are evil and and you want the government to be in place so that you restrict people from doing evil you punish the evil doers and people need to be we need to have an orderly life a life that's safe and that's why we have the government that's why we have police officers that's why we have these things in our life to keep us safe and so therefore the government then should be in place in order to punish evil and then secondly to praise good that's why you see statues and monuments of different people throughout our country and throughout the world in different places where where they kind of praise the good of that person and you can Look at the, some of the statues and monuments that are up, and you say, wait, 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 time out. They're an evil person. Why is that statue up there? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, anyway, we'll move on from that. So the purpose of government is to punish evil and to praise good. So the praise good is to celebrate and encourage good things, and that's where the government should be. Our tension is... And, and this is something that's a wrestling point that we have to figure out and sort out. It, it comes when government allows evil and sometimes praises evil. And there's some tension there today because we would look at some of the things that um, are currently happening and say, wait, wait, time out. That's evil according to objective truth, the Bible, God's word. That's evil what they're doing here. And, and, and the government's not doing what it should do there. They're allowing evil. And they're sometimes praising it. And that's been happening forever. That's not new. And so in our culture, we have the opportunity to elect officials that hopefully will represent the, the good and evil that we represent, that we look at, and, and the objective truth that we have and say, they're closely aligned with, with the objective truth of the good and evil that I see, that God's given to me, and so therefore I'd like that kind of an official that's uh, elected in there. And there's some disagreements even within that and some challenges there. So in a nutshell... Peter simply says, be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution. But I don't always agree with it. But, but sometimes they don't do the right things. He didn't say that. And by the way, let's go back into Peter's context. And Peter and Paul write about this several different times. And Jesus talks about this as well. And we're going to get back to that uh, as we end the message. But, but we, they, they talk about this and they all say the same thing. Be subject. Paul even says that God ordains the authorities that are in place. Which is like, wow, wait a second. So you're saying God chose that one to be the governor, that one to be the president, that one to be the police officer, that one? Like God chose that. And, uh, and so there's some wrestling points there. So with Paul and Peter, did they have a pure and perfect government to follow. If you know anything about history, just go back to the Roman government and go back to uh, Nero. I mean, just kind of talk about Nero just a little bit. Anybody name their dog Nero? 
I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't do that, right? Like, yeah, not good. You know, so Nero, not a great guy, and he built a lot of you know, statues about himself because he thought he was a great guy, um, but he was not a great guy. As a matter of fact, he blamed a lot of things on Christians and hated Christians to the degree that he um, kind of uh, manipulated situations to make Christians look bad and did that and different things. And, and Peter and Paul knew all about this, and Peter and Paul are the recipients of some of the things that happened there. By the way, Paul martyred for his faith by the government. Peter, same issue. These weren't people outside, just civilians that, that oh, you know, I tried to rob them and kill them. No, this was the government actually killing them. And here Peter and Paul are saying the same thing, a be subject to this authority. Isn't this weird? Do you see the tension now? It's almost an unresolvable tension in some ways. But it is resolvable. And here is the pivot point. Our series is called Pivot. And the pivot point for this message is right here. The pivot point is when we make Jesus our Lord, we become his ambassadors. So we pivot from Americans to heaven's ambassador in America. What does that look like? Or in your country, maybe you're watching from Germany or somewhere else and you're watching there. It's your country that you're living in. And so here's the pivot point. Remember verse 11. He says this. He says, beloved, I urge you as what? Sojourners and exiles, or a better word or another word that could be used synonymously is ambassadors. You are not here permanently. It's essentially, you're set in a, uh, a, a context where you're sent out to be an ambassador, that God brought you into this world, and he brought you to a point where you know who Jesus is, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, and now you have marching orders that you are the ambassador now. You pivot away from saying, oh, I'm an American. I, I have an American flag that I, that I run around on, and I'm not condemning that. That's whatever. But... But instead of that being my identity and what I live for, I breathe for, and all these other things, instead of that, now I pivot away from that and say, oh, wait a second, I'm no longer simply an American. I live in America, but I'm an ambassador from heaven for God's sake, the Lord's sake, to be that ambassador to the place that I'm living. There's the pivot point. So then I look at everything through a different lens. If you are sent to another country, a couple years ago, we got to go to, to Rome, right, and, and to Italy. And if we were an ambassador to this other country, here's what we did while we were there. <laughs> we didn't know the language, right? And so we kind of observed culture, and we watched what's culture doing, and how are they handling and this and that and the other thing. And, oh, wow, that's different. Let's check out their food. Let's check out this. And they see, we see different things about the culture that's there. If I were an ambassador... I would go and I would say, hey, listen, I think this might be better if we just made this change and worked on this. That's an ambassador. But an ambassador is not going to pick a fight. It's going as a representative of the country, of the one that's sending them. And that's the pivot point. I am coming into my town, into my community, into my state, into my country, and I'm coming as now an ambassador for the Lord's sake, and I'm saying I'm going to be subject while I'm an ambassador. If you say I need to turn right, fine, I'll turn right. And if you tell me i got to put a blinker on to turn right, I'll do that too, you know, even though it takes so much energy to turn my blinker on, and, and it does. I mean, you're with me? Anybody with me there? I mean, my teenagers, they point this out. Dad, why don't you use a blinker? I don't know. Anyway, I digress. But, but it's all the same, isn't it? Be subject. They said, turn left. I'm turning left. They say, go straight. I'm going straight. And so I'm doing that, and they say, don't go this fast. I'm not going that fast. And so I'm being subject to the higher power for the Lord's sake because I'm an ambassador. My pivot point, I'm an ambassador, not a citizen here. Because I'm only here for a couple more decades. I, this is not my home. The house I'm living in, cool house, great place to live. It's not lasting forever. Right? And now I'm glad I'm not living here forever. Aren't you? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I've said recently, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready. <laughs> right? But that's the pivot point. When we make Jesus our Lord, we become his ambassador. 
And we, we, so we pivot from Americans to heaven's ambassador in America. And that's what it's challenged, challenged us to do. And so what does it look like to be an ambassador? And he spends the next part of the text to do that. So if we pivot away from, I'm an American, and we get in our mind, okay, wait, no, I, I'm an ambassador from heaven, for Jesus' sake, for the Lord's sake, and I'm here doing his work. So what do I do with that? Next verse. For this is the will of God. Now stop there. That's only mentioned a few times in the Bible where it says, this is the will of God. Some people wonder, as a teenager, I wondered, what is God's will for me? Who should I marry? What school should I go to? Where should I move? Should I take this job? And what's God's will? Here's what Peter says. Stop. This is God's will for you. Okay, cool. Are you going to tell me the college? Are you going to tell me who I should marry? You know, no, God's not going to do that. What he does is he goes a little bit deeper than that. He says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good. So by doing good is going back to the general context before, back to verse number 12, to keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So here's the, the good that we're supposed to be doing. That by doing good, <clears throat> you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. That while you're doing the good things, as an ambassador, you come in and say, okay, here's the good thing I should be doing in my community right now. Here's the good things that I should be doing, and I, I, I should make sure that my whole energy, my effort, works on doing good. <laughs> so what does that look like? You're, you're doing good. You're being a blessing. It looks like caring for people, doesn't it? I think sometimes the church has given up its its god-given responsibility to be good to the community and allowed for other organizations or allowed for even the government to take that over because we're not doing a good job i think we could do better over time but i think right now we're trying to do really good and i'm excited for what we as a church have done collectively over this last year or individually i've seen individuals and i've seen groups of people reach out and care for different people in in different ways whether it's giving out food or money or reaching out and helping people with different things i've seen that especially in a pandemic i've seen people in this church specifically reach out and care for people and i'm excited for that could we do more i think you can always do more can't you and, and that's the problem. It's like, how, how, much, how much can you do? Well, the point isn't, did I do everything? It's, am I following God and doing God's will by doing good? Do I have a mark on my life that says, I'm, I'm doing good to those? Around. Am I caring for, am I helping, am I fostering, am I adopting, am I doing good for, am I being a generous person? Because that's what he's calling us to do. And, and if you go back in context, here's what the early church did. They were known, during that early church time, they were known for the good things that they did. They were generous with their money. They, they sold things. You go back to Acts, and you see how they sold things, and, and they used that money to help people that were poor and in poverty. And according to church history, uh, the, church, er, the early church was, was responsible for adopting kids that were just kind of thrown out into the street, and parents couldn't afford to. They threw them out in the street, and, and you'd have the church community just wrapping their arms around saying, we need to do something. And so they cared for the kids, and, and, and it was amazing as you read the history around that, that the world looked and said, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> They're saying, well, we're, we're doing good. It's what we're supposed to be doing. But one of the issues, to, if I were to get into, uh, one of the issues I, I really struggle with is abortion. I, I see that abortion is not what God would want. I see it as murdering a baby, right? And so, Fine. We, we, can, we can hone in on that, but here's, here's where I think the church falls short. We talk about being pro-life, but I think that better, we're pro-birth. We should be pro-life that lasts beyond the time a child is born, and we should be caring for the mother and child, or mother, father, child, and reaching out and putting our arms around and doing a better job there. And I'd like for, for us over time to see how that could work in our culture. And I think we fight a fight just for pro-birth, and then we just abandon and let them go and say, okay, now that you have the baby, have fun. The problem wasn't that they wanted an abortion. The problem was they knew after the time a child was born, they didn't know what they, how they could handle and how they could manage life with a child. 
This is where a church comes in and can really help with individuals like that where you say, hey, listen, we want to help. How can we care for you? How can we love on you? How can we provide and do things so that, so that we can, as a community, raise this child up to know that God loves them and to share in that and to be able to grow out of that? There's just an idea. Again, uh, this is, that's not political at all, by the way, okay? That, that's something that God's Word, and we can dive into that at some point in time if you want. But, um, so I'm just picking one example. What does it look like to do good? And that's bigger, and then smaller is just, hey, somebody needs some food, I give them food. Somebody is sick, and I find out that they're sick, instead of them like, trying to figure out, how do I go out and get food? I say, hey, listen, I'm going to the grocery store. What can I get for you? And, and you do that as you're going. And we do that because we're building a community of people that care for each other and put our arms around each other. We gather in our Zoom, our small groups, so that we can know what's going on with each other and with the extended family beyond that, not to get into each other's business, but so we can care. And so we look out for them and we say, hey, listen, I see you've gotten sick. Instead of treating you like you've got the scarlet letter and we don't ever want to talk to you again because this is probably permanent and you always get a sick or something. Like no, instead we look and we say, okay, let's, let's be scientific about this. Okay, that's where you are. How can I go get some groceries and bring some food over? Or how can I do something that's going to help you through this? And so that's what we do. That's being good, Right? We care for, you help, you foster, you adopt, you provide for, you do those things. And here's what it does. It puts the accusers to silence as we do good. In that day, Christians were called troublemakers, but over time, Christians affected the government, affected society in such a significant way that you see, as you look back at history, you see that they marked society from that day forward. Because they learned how to serve the community. And can I just pause and say that evangelical Christians today are being called troublemakers. Some of that is justified. Fair enough? So in order to get through that, we need to do good to put the silence. Don't bother arguing. That's not what he says. Don't argue and say, oh, I'm not as bad as you think. No, just do good. Do the right thing. And I'll say it this way, the church, us as individuals, followers of Jesus, the church should be such an important part of the community because of all the good that we're doing. So that the community says, oh no, no, I'm standing up for them. I don't agree with their Jesus thing and, and all of that and, and, uh, and some of their stands, but here's what I know. They're not the way you're saying. They're not the what you're portraying. They were good to me. When I was down, they took care of me. I saw them go down to the street to so-and-so, and they did this, and I saw this, that, and the other thing, and they are a good people. I might not like their Jesus. I might think they're a little off the rocker there, but they are good. And that's what Peter is saying. And so here's how we get through some of those things. We simply get up and we say, okay, we're going to do good. We're going to love on people the way that we should Verse 17 and, and verse 16 uh, kind of run into it. He says, live as people who are free. We're free not from the government per se. We're, we're under, we're subject to the government. And so we understand that, but we're free to do what the government tells us to do. I'm a free person that says, okay, if you say turn right, I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to fight about it. It's not my fight. That's what you say. Fine. I'll even use my blinker this time. Okay. And, and so we do that in a way that we're free to do what God wants us to do then, so he says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And here's how. Honor everyone. So I honor you. I honor them. I disagree with them. Show honor. When you write something on Facebook about someone else, are you showing honor? That's where we should be. Honor everyone. But I disagree with them. I disagree with their stand. So what? Honor everyone. Honor them. What does it make? How, how do you feel when you're honored? For me, sometimes I'll get introduced as pastor. I'm honored. It's embarrassing. Right? I feel like, yeah, I'm just Bill. Can I just crawl under a shell somewhere? It feels cool, though. 
When's the last time you've made someone feel that way? Where you honored them in such a way. You didn't focus on the disagreement or the, the things that annoy you. You honored them. Honor everyone, he says. Love the brotherhood. Who's the brotherhood? That's the church. Love each other. Man, I'm so glad we get to hang out and be together. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, which is interesting because he's using something different. He doesn't simply say honor God, but fear God. And also the next statement, he says honor the emperor. He doesn't say fear the emperor. So the only one he uses fear for is God. The emperor, honorer, and other people honor, and we should fear God. Why? Because God is in charge of all. And so all together then, This happens as a church when we pivot our citizenship from here to there. As we pivot our citizenship away from saying, I'm a citizen of heaven, and we pivot into saying, oh, no, no, no. I'm a a citizen of America. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm an ambassador in America. I'm an ambassador in this country. I'm an ambassador in Magnolia. I'm an ambassador right here, right now. So while I'm here, this is what God wants me to do. Let me give you two examples, and then we'll close. Here's one. Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. We won't turn there, but you can read this through in your own. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel is an Israelite, Jewish person, that's taken captivity into Babylon. And while he's there, he's under King Nebuchadnezzar. Then King Nebuchadnezzar um, is kind of pushed out, and then you have Darius as the king. And so now he's following Darius, and all along he says, okay, I'm, and he lives like an ambassador. And you can look, Dan- Daniel chapter 1 through chapter 6, he is living like an ambassador. He's living like someone that says, hey, listen, God is my authority. He is my Lord. He is my authority. But while I'm here, I'll do what you ask me to do in a very challenging place. And so while he's there, he changes his diet or or asks them to change the diet so that he can do what, what would be right before God. And they allow it, and God blesses. So he continues to live on through that, and then you get to Daniel chapter 6 under King Darius, and the other guys, the other satraps, we'll call it, or the other kind of people going to King Darius, they didn't like him at all. They, and they, they were just annoyed with him, even though he did a lot of good things, and it says about them, they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel. He just annoyed them, right? And so, and some people are like that. Here's the reality. As followers of Jesus, there will be people that say, as the ambassador for Jesus, they say, we just don't like you. You didn't do anything wrong, but we just don't like you. That's going to be part of life sometimes. And that's where Daniel finds himself. So they all get together, 120, go up to the king and say, hey, listen, king, we found some people. They're really messed up people in in your kingdom that they're making petition. They're asking other gods for things. And you, king, are our god. So what we want to do is we want to make a rule that no one can ask of any other God other than you. And if they violate this, we want to throw them into, you know, you know the family room you got over there? That cool place you have, King? You know, underneath the family room, uh, there's family night. You get together and say, hey, kids, what do you want to do? And, and the kids are like, oh, I know, I know. Do you want to watch a movie? No, 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 no. Can we go to the lion's den? You know, the place next to the family room? We want to watch this really cool thing. Okay, that didn't happen, but... Could you imagine in the palace of the king having a lion's den? Now, anyone that disobeyed this, they were going to get thrown into the lion's den. What does Daniel do? Immediately, because they they, they were trapping him. They're like, we know he's a person of prayer. He's going to make petition to God. And so we're going to find a time that he does, and we're going to get him. So Daniel immediately goes to his normal prayer closet right next to his window. He goes and he prays and and does what he normally does. When they come and they find him praying, and they take him before the king, and they say, King, we found the guy! So Daniel literally practiced civil disobedience. You see it. How did he do that? He did not burn the palace down. He did not kill anyone. He followed the Lord as his authority and did what God would want him to do as his authority, not hurting anyone, but only doing good. Do you see the distinction? And so as he's doing good, as he's praying, he gets caught in the act. He is willing to suffer the penalty for following God. And so as he's willing to to go through the penalty for that, he's thrown into the lion's den. 
And when I was in Sunday school, they had flannel graph for this, and, and I picture the den being underneath, and you kind of drop them in, and that was the flannel graph, do, 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 do. and then he's in the, in, in the um, lion's den with the lions. And what happens there? The king goes to bed. He can't sleep so well. He gets up extra early because here's the reality. Daniel was such a good person to have in the kingdom that he hated to see him go. You see that? It drove him nuts that he made a law that affected Daniel negatively because Daniel was such a great guy. He's only done good to me, but I got to follow the rule. I got to be consistent with the, my own rule. So he throws him into the lion's den. He gets up the next morning and he wakes up early. He comes down to the lion's den and he goes, Daniel, did your God save you? Are you still there? Daniel goes, oh, man, King, why are you waking me up? I'm having a great night's sleep. Man, these lions, they are so comfortable and relaxed, and this has been good. Can you bring some, I could use some bacon and some scrambled eggs. And Do you see the story, how it works out? Daniel's just hanging out with the lions. Everything's cool. Everything's fine. And, and King Darius is, is all panicked about this. Well, the lions, they got their meal later on because he tossed the rest of the satraps in there, and they were gone. But, but the point is, that Daniel practiced civil disobedience in a time where it disagreed with God. And God saw fit to use all of the good that he did to protect his reputation, one. And God miraculously protected his life. That didn't always happen. There are many people that gave up their lives while doing the right thing for God, practicing a civil disobedience. Okay? By the way, Let's define civil disobedience in this. They didn't burn the place down. They didn't hurt anyone. Okay? Now, I know. Red flags, right? There, and there's some different ways of going about that. But I, I, I just want to give you a couple of generalized thoughts. Here's another one. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is, is in a conversation, as he often is, with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees come up to him, and they're trying to trick him. And, and it says this in, in verse 15, Then the Pharisees went and plotted to how to entangle him in his words, Jesus in his words, and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God truthfully. Isn't that great? I mean, what a compliment. Now, wouldn't that be nice to have that said of you? We know that everything you say, look, you're totally true. You're not dishonest. We know that of you. And, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, and, uh, for you are not swayed by appearances. Oh, what an awesome statement about Jesus. He says, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So here's what they're asking. These religious guys are asking, is it okay to not pay taxes? Is civil disobedience okay because we disagree with the taxes that we are, we are asked to give? Is civil disobedience okay? Is the question. So they're trying to trap Jesus in this. And I love Jesus' response because here's the thing. When you're asking the question, you have control of the conversation, don't you? So they think they're in control of the conversation. Jesus does what he always does. He turns around and he says this to him. One, he says, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin, coin for the tax. So here's what they do. They brought him a denarius. That means a valuable, it's like bringing out a $100 bill, Okay. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Question two. So now Jesus in, is in charge of the conversation. You see how this is going? They said, well, Caesar's. They said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And then when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. They, they had nothing. It was it. It was like, okay, so civil disobedience kind of tossed out. I've, it's Caesar's coin, so I give to Caesar what is his. Time out. Don't miss this. While he's saying that to them, what is he saying to them? The inscription on the coin is of Caesar's face. The face of every Pharisee, every disciple, is the image of who? God. So by application, you would see Jesus saying very poignantly, 
but you are image bearers of God. So do what God would want you to do. And they missed it. You see, our face is created in the image of God. And so for our life, we need to be thinking, what would God want me to do in this? What good would God have for me to do in this? And this is why, for Milestone, we have not encouraged civil disobedience by meeting when the government said, don't meet. Because we knew we could meet online. We knew we could meet in other ways that were totally legal. It was not the time for civil disobedience at all because they were not taking our full rights away. They were actually acting in a way that was protective. And we looked at that and we said, we respect, we care for that. We're going to do the best we can to live within the guidelines there. That's why we took the stands that we did in the beginning back in March of this pandemic. And that's why we are still continuing to practice that even the way that we're meeting why? Because our mission is not to go against the government while the government is confusing at times and hypocritical times and have fun with all of that. That's not my mission. I am an ambassador for God in America, in Magnolia. I'm not an American first. It's where I used to be. Because he is my Lord, I'm his ambassador. So what good am I supposed to be doing? And I would say, we need to pivot our citizenship, don't we? We need to, if you haven't, you need to pivot your citizenship and be a blessing as an ambassador from heaven to our country, to our state, to our town. That's where we need to be. So, what good are you doing? Could you imagine if we all applied this together. And we all thought about this this week. And we simply said, what good can I do for those around me? Wouldn't we be praying for all of our government officials? Whew, they need it. I would, listen, if you asked me to be the president of the United States, I would say, I'm running I'm leaving town. There's no way. The decisions that person has to make are just incredible. No thank you. And all the way down. Governor, all the way through. And we get to look and throw shots at them and say, oh man, I'd never do it that way. But don't ever give me the opportunity to make that decision. No thanks. We should be praying for them. They have huge decisions to make. And be praying that they would come to understand what evil is and what good is. And Co make sure it's coinciding with God's truth. And we should be so actively looking for ways to be good so that, like the king with Daniel, the king says, the, the people around say, huh, they're so valuable here, I want them here. And we need them. We need Milestone Church to be part of our community. We can't have them go away. We need them because they're a blessing in so many different ways. Not because they're a religious organization, but because of what they are doing. You can see God has marked their life so significantly. And so that's where we should be. And so this year, we want to keep making ways to do that and being creative. I am so excited. Michelle was uh, not here today, but was here last week. I meant to ask her to share a bit last week. And, and, uh, and last uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, she went out with a group of people, and she handed out blankets blankets and, and a couple other things in, in this bag for homeless people and people in need. And she came with, I think, around, around 100 blankets or so, not knowing who they would go to. And they went so fast, she was blown away. And it was just simply on her heart to do something good for people that needed help. And so she asked people in our church to help out, and she was blown away by the response because many people just said, oh, yeah, I'll help, I'll help, I'll help. And money kept on coming in, and blankets came, and it just was, overnight, it became a huge blessing. You know, if we did just the little things like that all year long, how cool would that be? It, we'd stop fighting, not that we are, but we would not have a fight about politics because it wouldn't matter. We're ambassadors. They can do what they want. I'll pray for them. But I'm an ambassador. 
So I'm going to do the good thing that God's called me to do. So let's pray together as we close. God, thank you so much that you have chosen us to follow you and to be your ambassador. And Lord, as we, as we go out of here, Lord, give us the, the vision that you want for our community, our family, our, our town, our state, our government, our, this place that we're living in. That we'd be a blessing, that we would do the good things that you've called us to. Help us not to get wrapped up in the things that are going on around us and, and get so stuck here. Because, Lord, we know this is just temporary. And, Lord, we certainly pray, Lord, come quickly. Thank you, God, for our time together. Thank you for your guidance through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I mean, thanks for joining uh, me this morning and all together. And next week, we're going to be looking at pivoting your family. So don't miss out as we look at our family relationships um, in the next couple of weeks here. All right, have a great day. Take care.